Hello, dark reader, and welcome to the Dark Side of the Library podcast. I'm your host, Katie, and today we are going to be talking about the second part of the Atlas Six. I'm assuming trilogy, or maybe more. We did do a mini-sode about the first book, The Atlas Six, by Olivia Blake a couple weeks ago, actually, and I was like, you know what, everything's still really fresh, so I'm going to go in and do the second book. So just so you know, there will be spoilers because this is technically the second book. I do recommend checking out the first book. It is really interesting if you like Dark Academia. Um, it definitely has a different take on what that looks like. And it's one of the only book talk books I think I've read so far that I think was actually worth it. And I think it's actually pretty good for the most part. So I do recommend it. So go ahead, check out the first book. I'm assuming since you're here, you probably have read The Atlas Six already and you probably know who Olivia Blake is. If not, let me just review her super duper duper fast. She is a New York Times bestselling author of a lot of novels and graphic novels and scripts and all kinds of stuff. The Atlas Six, published by Tor, is a huge deal and it's going to have a TV adaptation by Amazon. I don't know when, but that's really cool. It seems like she writes pretty fast, so I'm hoping that the next part of the story comes out fairly soon. She is amazing and she got a lot of her traction, especially with this particular book, through TikTok. Now, let me just summarize what the Atlas Paradox is about. Again, there might be some spoilers here, so if you haven't read the first book, go ahead and read it because I thought it was really good. All right, so the Atlas Paradox this is book two. Destiny is a choice. It's the long-awaited sequel to the dark academia sensation, The Atlas Six. Six magicians, two rivalries, one researcher, and a man who can walk through dreams all must pick a side. Do they wish to preserve the world or destroy it? The Society of Alexandrians is revealed for what it is, a secret society with raw, world-changing power headed by a man whose plans to change life as we know it are already underway, but the cost of knowledge is steep, and the price of power demands each character to choose a side. Which alliances will hold and which will see their enmity deepen? All right, so we're going to just, I'm going to go through my thoughts here on this book and for the millionth time, there will be spoilers. I can't talk about this without spoiling some of the story. So turn off the podcast if you want to read this book and you haven't yet and you don't want to be spoiled. Otherwise, stick around. Let's begin with kind of summarizing the end of the first book. Basically, Libby is kidnapped by her ex, like, I guess, well, yeah, it's her ex, boyfriend Ezra, who ends up having time-traveling capabilities, with, and he actually has a relationship with Atlas, like, he's known Atlas for a really long time. So that's how the first book ends, and all of the other characters are like, hmm where's Libby gone? Because originally it was about potentially sacrificing somebody in the first book. And a lot of people had their eyes on Callum, who's kind of, you know, he was, I guess, playing the villain a little bit because he wanted to. He's, I don't know. Anyway, so now we're in the second book, which you would think is about trying to find Libby, which it is a part of it. Um, But then there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on in this book. But also, I have to be honest, there's really nothing else. Like, there's nothing going on simultaneously. It's weird. So here's my first thing. I really, really liked the first book. I didn't like how it ended necessarily. I thought it was, it wasn't quite a a cliffhanger, but it was like just the foundation for the next step or the next book. I just didn't feel like it had as much substance as it could have, and it was just kind of preparing us for this book, The Atlas Paradox. So I was really excited to pick up this book because I was like, okay, there's going to be a lot of things that are explained. For instance, Atlas, like his whole background, Atlas and Ezra, their relationship, and other things too. 
one thing I did like about this book is Gideon. We get a lot more uh, Gideon scenes, and he actually is probably one of the most pivotal characters in this entire book, which is hilarious because we have these allegedly six most powerful uh, magic users in the entire world, and yet they are some of the most useless people in this book. Holy cow. So it's interesting. We In the beginning, it builds up and we're... It, Basically, we get this huge explanation and visual of how powerful and how awesome these guys are and how they're, they are reacting to each other and how their powers kind of can play alongside each other. We get only a little bit of that. It's a very different feeling in this book and it feels... I don't know. It feels like a lot of the really cool characters become more subdued. For instance... Uh, Nico and Tristan are some of the most useless characters. I actually don't really understand why Tristan is there sometimes. He is still, I mean, I said this before, he's still the most oblivious character in the entire book, and I just feel like he shouldn't be. It feels so strange. Before I get into the weeds too much, I guess what I want to pull back on is that one of the things that I talked about on our previous podcast episode about the Atlas Six was it was very interesting and very cool how each character played off of each other. So we would have Parisa and Tristan. They were kind of paired off for a while. Nico and Lily. We even had Tristan and Callum. And now we have another opportunity to kind of do something really similar because there's different pairings this time for the most part so we have Tristan and Nico kind of paired up right now and then we had Callum and Reyna paired up and I thought it would have a very similar feel where we would get to see not only how each personality was able to bring good and bad parts out of each character but also their power dynamic and unfortunately it felt very sloppy this time. Even Parisa, who had a huge chunk, like the first book, there's a huge chunk of Parisa and how, you know, she might not be the most physically apt character or badass, but the way she uses her power against people like, for instance, Callum, that's really fascinating. And not to derail this any further, but in addition to this Parisa thought, Something about Parisa's character in the first book that was great was that she was very calculating. She definitely established relationships with specific people and made conversations with them for her own personal gain. And now in this book, she is literally all over the goddamn place. I'm not even sure what her deal is, to be honest. She was actually one of my favorite characters in the first book. And in this book, I almost feel like she really wasn't present. I really don't know what she was doing. But all of this to say, all of these relationships and these dynamics and the power struggle, really, it all feels incredibly dumbed down now, which was a huge disappointment. One of the characters I was really sad that they didn't talk about in the first book was Reyna. And she gets a little more spotlight in the sequel. Unfortunately, I'm just a little sad. She is a little confusing too because actually I guess Callum technically points this out but Reyna likes to pride herself in the fact that she doesn't care about other people and that she's more concerned about her personal development and that she's never really been involved with other people and had no desire to be but Reyna makes some very irrational choices and has some really interesting thought processes that seem highly reactive for a person that doesn't give a shit. It's almost like it's a facade. She's like, I don't care, but she does. <laughs> and I hate it, actually, because she seemed like she would be such a cool character. I do like some parts with Reyna and Callum. So Reyna and Callum start to develop a really like a friendship, I guess, an alliance together. But anyway, so Reyna and Callum do have an interesting dynamic. That was one of one of the more entertaining parts of the book, more philosophical. Reyna, you know, she creates life. So uh, Callum is kind of guiding her through a lot of these thought processes about giving life and she also is involved or 
she wants to learn more about ancient folklores and gods and like you know how gods die eventually and she believes that she's really you know she brings life she's a very powerful entity so there's a lot of cool stuff going on there but even so I felt like nothing was happening in the book. I wasn't really sure wh what are you guys trying to accomplish here. I thought, you know, the whole purpose of the end of the book is that Libby is missing. We also hardly know who Atlas is. Why did they have to murder somebody? Like, what is the point of that for the society? It didn't seem like anybody was on the same page. We had, like, Nico, who was trying to clearly find Libby, Tristan, I guess, was a part of it. I'm not really sure. He was just there. We have Parisa kind of doing Parisa things. She's like all about Dalton. Then we have Callum who decides to be extra emo, which at fr I just didn't think it fit. I felt like he was kind of beyond that. Like he was too good to be emo, but instead he decides to dive into some serious like alcoholism. Raina, who's like struggling with the fact that she might be romantically interested in Nico, but not sure because she's never had that experience before. And it's just a hot mess. Like, there's so many other things going on here, like who the society is, where Libby is, why this whole process needed to happen, who Atlas is, and what, like, what is his role in the Alexandrian society. But none of that is really further explored or explained like it kind of is but it just leaves more questions there's everything is very fragmented and there's just the the yarn keeps going I can't find the end in sight and the yarn is not only going it's everywhere there's different yarns it's crazy there's just so much book there I don't know how else to explain that it started to pick up probably around page 370, finally. That's a long time to be committed to a novel where it finally starts to kick off a little bit. And then finally, we have this weird thing. So Libby Rhodes and her journey through time actually is kind of entertaining. And it's, I would say, probably the best parts of the book and just her growth. Because in the beginning, in the first book, Everybody picks on her for being uh, so, she's really geeky and nerdy and the thing that holds her back is her, she doesn't have any confidence and now we're realizing just how powerful she is and she's realizing it too and maybe time travel was the way to go. But, so Libby finds this character named Bellin and they start to establish a relationship with each other and it was a weird one. Honestly, how I felt like Bellin ended up becoming was <laughs> she reminded me of Gretchen Wieners from Mean Girls, just the way that she started to unravel after Libby leaves. Um, <laughs> cause she's just like, you know, I don't, it's the weirdest development for a character and it was terrible. And she was shrill and just like really a little psycho. Cause like, Libby Rhodes essentially ruined her life, but really shouldn't have because it really, oh God, because she grows old and it's all about how Libby Rhodes has ruined her life and uh, way back in the past. It's just wild. So that whole thing was strange and could have been left out entirely. There's a lot of things that don't make a lot of sense in the in this book that I was hoping um, would be would create more clarity, like what Gideon's role is in the world. Like Gideon's, uh, honestly, I really like Gideon's character. I want to figure out more about him. And he's not even a part of the Atlas Six whatsoever, but I'm just kind of, I'm, I just want to know more about him. And I, I feel like the book left more questions than answers. There's a lot of very, very loose ends. Um, things are starting to fall really flat there was really no progress with the book. Love interests are actually kind of becoming a little more clumsily put together, whereas in the first book, holy cow, I loved what they were, what um, Olivia Blake was doing in the first book with like how their relationships were developing. It made sense. It was really fun. 
um, and entertaining, but this one, it just felt really clunky and kind of weird sometimes. And there are a lot of cute parts, but I'm just like, I don't, I don't get what's happening right now. We also have some other parts, newer additions to the book with Tristan's dad. The characters are all over the place. There's a little too many plot points going on, and I'm hoping she can rein it in and make it make, you know, put it all together because this book was, yeah, this book definitely fell flat for me, unfortunately. I'm really sad because I really did enjoy the first book. It, I was so intrigued, and now it's starting to feel more like that YA novel versus, like, the new adult novel books I it just yeah it's starting to get a little a little much so this is my review of the atlas paradox it was a very very long read it's about 400 pages if not more it is very very long and most of it there's no progress it's like I don't really know what y'all are doing and honestly, I kind of got to the point where I'm like, I don't even care because it seemed like nobody cared. Everybody's doing their own thing. And in the real world, that works. But in a story where you need a narrative, it just isn't working for me. I will obviously pick up the last book whenever that does come out because I do want to see things end and figure out what's going on here. But this is a very long book. Um, it's definitely not as great as the first one, in my opinion. Maybe we'll get a cool, like, a return of the king. Who knows? So, if you are still committed to the Atlas Six series, definitely pick up The Atlas Paradox by Olivia Blake. Um, just be prepared for some of those um, pacing issues. But... That might not be entirely true. Some people really dug it. There's a lot of cool stuff in there still, like philosophy, psychology, and time traveling too. That's really interesting. So check this out. It's The Atlas Paradox. It's by Olivia Blake. If you guys are looking for more dark reads, make sure to come join us on our socials at Instagram, YouTube, and our Amazon Live channel. And make sure to rate and review on your favorite listening app. It's, it helps us out. And if there's any books that you guys are looking for, uh, any dark, creepy reads, go ahead and check out our show notes at darksideofthelibrary.com. You'll find a whole bunch of those. And be sure to share this podcast with your favorite freaky friends and family. Thank you guys so much for listening. Have a creeptastic week. <laughs>